who you are and the organisation you represent. Good morning. I'm Melanie Rees. I'm Head of Policy at the Chartered Institute of Housing. I'm Tamara Sandul. I'm the Policy Manager at the Chartered Institute of Environmental Health. I'm Alison Farrer. I'm a volunteer lead officer for the Chartered Institute of Trade and Standards. Thank you very much for coming today. Um, Helen, over to you to start the questions. Thank you. Um, could you tell us, from the perspective of each of your organisations, um, the scale of the problem that you perceive with low standards in the private rented sector, and also which groups um, within the population are most likely um, to be at risk of living in poor quality accommodation? Um, I think the first thing um, it's worth noting is the scale with which the sector has grown. Um, 4.7 million households are living in that sector now. Um, a huge number of households with children, um, 38%, um, and that's increased by a million over the last two years. So there are lots of issues attached to that, um, we would think. Um, the English Housing Survey shows that around 27% of privately rented homes um, are below the decent home standard. And there's analysis from Shelter that shows that a million homes have at least one hazard um, that affects health and safety, and around 2.5 million house people within those households um, are affected by that. I think... Um, the other thing worth noting is that privately rented homes generally are older. Um, so 35% were built before 1919. So there are particular structural issues um, for those homes, particularly around damp and so on. So those are sort of headlines from us. Um, well, from an environmental health perspective, what our members are most interested in is, of course, the effect on health uh, from poor housing. Um, the British uh, research establishment estimated that £1.4 billion pounds of costs to the NHS um, uh, result from poor housing conditions. Um, the private rented sector, unfortunately, has some of the worst conditions. Um, whether you look at energy efficiency or whether you look at smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms, or the category one hazards, which are the most serious hazards under the housing health and safety rating system. 17% of private renter sector dwellings have one of these hazards. That makes around 800,000 homes, according to our calculations from the English Housing Survey. Um, and the private renter sector has been increasing and it continues to increase. So even in the past year, whilst the proportion of the sector has remained at 20%, it actually increased by 200,000 homes. Um, that's a huge number and it keeps growing um, and it's a concern to us. Can I explain from a trading standards perspective? Um, most of this work would be dealt with, the housing standards and the, and the quality would be dealt with by our colleagues in housing and environmental health. What people would come to trading standards for it would be issues such as um, being conned out of the fees or being misled in some way, something under the consumer protection from unfair trading regulations and that kind of thing. Um, my day job is I work for the National Trading Standards Estate Agency team, but that doesn't at present cover lettings. Um, in that job, we do get quite a lot of people who come and, and query issues about lettings and that kind of thing, so I do have some experience of that. But at present, um, issues about lettings that come to trading standards would mostly be about being misled into the contact, contract in the beginning, and as well, uh, fake landlords and that kind of thing, where people are pretending to be landlords and, and somebody hands over deposits and it turns out there's, there's no property to be let. There's an awful lot of that going on. So that's the kind of thing that we would deal with, so I wouldn't be able to answer your question sure. any okay. further Thank than you. that. Thank you. Um, can you say a bit about how each of your organisations work to improve standards, standards in the sector? And also, what are the strengths and weaknesses of those, of, of those approaches and the things that might perhaps be done differently? Um, well, uh, we are a registered charity and a professional body, so the professional body part of us, we set standards for our members, um, we set competencies, we ensure that they are up to date and they're doing professional development um, every year to be up to date. Uh, we're also an awarding body, so we 
ensure that qualifications for environmental health are up to date and they're getting the um, theory as well as the practice as part of their course and they're well trained. We're also a knowledge hub and we design lots of conferences, events, workshops, um, again to supplement knowledge, to look at court cases, to, to ensure that they're on top of their game. Um, and we also provide a news service um, as part of the um, EHA. Um, the, there are lots of strengths to our approach. We try and cover a lot of areas. Um, the weakness of our approach is the fact that we're very, very small um, and we would like to do so much more than we are able to. Um, CMH is the professional body for people who work in housing. We're also a charity. Um, but something we've done recently, which has um, been quite successful, is developed a qualification for landlords and lettings agents um, in letting and managing residential property. Um, it's still quite early days, but 220 have completed it so far. 440 are going through the programme. Um, we've had really good feedback from some of those who've completed saying they learnt things they didn't know were their responsibilities, which I think is really interesting, as well as learning about things they could do at the start of the tenancy to avoid difficulties as, as things unfold. Um, in terms of um, the, the relative strengths and weaknesses, of course it's the willing ones that are doing that qualification, um, but there's masses of scope for us to develop that further. Charter Trading Council Institute is a professional development body. We are a body for our members, so we undertake the training and the the qualifications for for our members. What we find is what what the previous panel said is that. Uh, resources an issue. Um, our latest workforce survey, which is just about to be released, talks about only 36% of authorities who responded are confident that they can recruit and retain staff, and that is because of the cuts to local authorities. Um, there's going to be the report of, of the first time a uh, trading standards authority who has no fully qualified trading standards officer within that local authority. Um, and, and while the local authority cuts continue, then this is of major concern to us as an institute. 57% um, of the people who responded to this survey say they have expertise to deal with local issues, which means the others don't because mm -hmm. of resourcing. Okay, thank you. Um, Tamara, can I ask you whether you help have also feedback from your members about resourcing um, within local authorities and, and the, the, the capability of your officers working in local authorities to cover the ground that they're tasked with, with dealing with? I think it varies quite a lot. Um, different authorities prioritise their housing enforcement teams in different ways. So in some areas we see teams that are very well resourced and others we're seeing teams of one or two people covering a whole county council le level area mm -hmm. and they, they can only provide a basic reactive service. Mm -hmm. um, we've had quite a lot of <coughs> evidence, including from, from the last panel, about the way that um, environmental health officers and trading standards officers work within local authorities and how that fits with housing authorities and, and so on. Um, could, you, could you tell us, in your view, how um, environmental health and trading standards could be aligned more effectively within local authorities to tackle low standards in the private rented sector? Um, well, it, it varies, the structure of local government varies, but in England, trading standards and local housing authorities do sit at different levels, um, and sometimes that means that they, they sit in different departments or part, they're part of different organisations. Mm. So where there are unitary authorities, the, the process of working together is much easier. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, if they sat closer together, it might, it might help with partnership working. Mm -hmm. um, we know that many of our members do work very closely with their trading standards counterparts, and we as, as professional bodies also work together uh, and encourage that. I think that's very true. Um, it is different in every local authority. Um, there is scope for collaboration and in some authorities um, the, the two departments sit within public protection or, or other similar departments. Um, 
we do different things and we work in different ways. Environmental health would look at the, the standards of the housing and, and obviously with the licensing of HMOs and that kind of thing. Trading standards would look at working in a different way. We work very much more intelligence-led rather than um, inspection-based. So that means we would, um, it's, it's born of necessity as well, we would have to look at what comes as a priority first. Um, what we would want to do, of course, is to look at the kind of issues that were happening locally within the area and look at national issues and how that could be addressed. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for collaboration work there um, and it's something that we would, we would be happy to develop in some areas. Do you have a view from, ha from housing about the relationship with environmental health and trading standards? Um, not specifically, except I think, the, as we can tell, the arrangements vary quite widely. Yeah. Some of the witnesses, including the Residential Landlords Association, told us that many environmental health officers have trouble understanding what their powers are. Um, and find it difficult to use them in practice. Um, would you agree with that statement? And if so, is that, is that an issue about the complexity of the, um, the enforcement powers and the regulation, or is that an issue about training and capacity um, of environmental health officers, or a mixture of the two? Um, well, we don't think that environmental officers don't understand their powers. In fact, you know, they, they are trained both in understanding the law and applying it as part of their qualification. They can't graduate until they can demonstrate that they, they can do both of those things, so the course is both practical and theoretical. We think that you know, comments such as those come from um, the fact that environmental health officers work for local authorities and all local authorities have their own enforcement policies and sometimes those can restrict what an environmental health officer can do. Um, so one of the ways that we believe that that could be perhaps improved is the Housing Health and Safety Rating System Enforcement Guidance. It's very old, it's from 2006, and it both says that you have to take a formal enforcement action on Category 1 hazards, but at the same time it encourages an informal approach um, before anything else. So it says try informal approaches first and use formal action as a last resort. That's very confusing and I don't believe that that's actually the stance of or the policy of central government at the moment. So having that old enforcement policy in place, which you know local areas draw from to make their own enforcement policies, is, is just, it, it's not very consistent. Mm -hmm. Linking on to um, something I'm just very interested to hear in your respective views, does the, the legislative framework then, through which the local authorities derive their powers to intervene, um, to what extent does that need overhauling? Maybe start with you, Ms. Reed. Um, I think, as Tamara said, the Housing, Health and Safety Rating System, HHR, has been in place for some time now. Um, the market has changed considerably in that time, as we were hearing from earlier witnesses. Um, I'm not sure we would say that we needed a radical overhaul, but it's worth noting that over the last two to three years we've seen a lot of new measures come into place. There are more in the pipeline, um, <coughs> more bills um, coming through the system um, and it's potentially worth seeing how all of those things work together and interact because it's happened on a piecemeal basis and not part of a tight strategy um, and seeing them bed in and where there may be some intended consequences or some lack of impact or some great outcomes it would be worth reviewing that in time um, I would just like to talk a bit about some research that we did um, we published in December where we asked lots of environmental health professionals what they thought of the HHSRS and 97% of them said that it should be updated. Now the whole system has several parts and you've heard about the underlying statistics. Um, the statistics actually come from the late 1990s, not 2006, so they're about 20 years old, <laughs> not 12 years old. So they really do need updating. 
Um, and the provisions in the operating guidance basically say to everyone who uses the system, it's your responsibility to keep up to date on any evidence relating to the 29 different hazards to different changing housing conditions. Now, if you ask thousands of people to keep up to date over 20 years to, on evidence relating to all of those things, you will get variations. So we think updating that system will really help to you know, bring back consistency and ensure that a system that's described as evidence-based is based on current evidence, not 20-year-old evidence. Trading standards don't really enforce the, the same legislation and therefore I, I believe the, the legislation and the powers that we have are sufficient for what we are expected to do in this area. Um, I do have some comments for later about consumer redress and, and that kind of issue around this because that's usually the, the problem that we come across. Okay, thank you. Um, an area of particular interest to me is about um, energy poverty and, and tackling that. And I think um, the committee heard previously from an organisation that described the, the minimum energy efficiency standards, which are due, I think, for implementation in April, uh, as not being fit for standard. Um, how do you think they should be amended prior to implementation? Perhaps Monday or um, tomorrow, I think. Well, the, the original regulations were drafted with the Green Deal in mind. Um, so landlords were required to bring their F and G rated properties up to an E standard where there was no upfront cost to them. The government's actually recognised that this is a massive loophole because it would require no landlords to make any improvements. So they're now consulting on bringing in a cost cap of £2,500 for those landlords with the worst energy efficient properties. To, to bring them up to an E standard, which isn't actually very high in itself, I should say, because that could still be really, really cold. Um, we actually think that the cap should be a bit higher, simply because that would only bring 30% of F and G properties up to an E standard, which is not good enough. Um, that would leave about 217,000 dwellings in the private rental sector languishing in F and G. Um, and since the government wants to bring all properties up to a C standard by 2030, it doesn't really make sense to allow those properties to, to sit there in, in the lowest bands. Um, so we'll be responding to that. We're very supportive of the fact that a cap is being introduced, but, but we'd like to, it to be a bit higher. So percent would, get, would, be, would rise up to F and G standard. Um, so if, if the £2,500 cap was to be introduced, only 30% of the F and G properties would be raised up to an E standard, so 70% would be left in the worst two standards. How many properties did you say that was? 217,000. Right, thank you. We know that 36% of people living in the private rented sector are living in poverty, so fuel poverty will be part of that. So measures of this kind are really important. Um, I think we have a question about awareness um, and the extent to which landlords will be aware of, of their obligations here. Um, we think some landlords and lettings agents, the better ones, will, will do these things automatically. Um, although there are some issues around the quality of assessments, they're not always easy to carry out. For instance, insulation under floorboards and, and things of that kind can be quite hard to, to assess. I think being realistic for many local authorities, enforcement may not be a, a high up the list of priorities because of the, the various pressures um, and the ways in which they're having to prioritise. Okay, thank you. And finally, um, you'll be familiar with Karen Buck's um, bill, which is the Fitness for Human Habitation and Liability for Housing Standards, a bit of a mouthful. Um, how do you think it could be improved um, uh, from the perspective of your organisations, perhaps <coughs> tomorrow? Um, well, we think that it needs to be aligned to other legislation. Um, obviously, the bill is seeking to amend a 1985 Tenant and Landlords Act. Um, in particular, there's a problem about retaliatory evictions. Um, if the local authority takes a formal action to protect a tenant in response to a complaint, the tenant should be protected for at least six months under that legislation, whereas if the tenant goes to court on their own, they won't be protected. So some provision needs to be made there. Um, 
but also I guess tenants need to be able to go to court with little or no representation um, that will be difficult um, the tribunals when they were first set up uh, were intended to be an easier type of court to go to but now we're hearing from our members that landlords are bringing barristers to that court which is not helpful and obviously a tenant might not feel confident or feel like they have a realistic chance to, to take their matters. But it's still, it's a great bill and we support Karen Buck's bill because it gives the tenant another avenue um, to get compensation. In some cases, if you're living with bad uh, conditions for about six months and then the landlord suddenly fixes something, you have no recourse to, to get any money back off your rent, whereas this bill would be an avenue that you could go to court and say, well, actually, you've put me in a dangerous position and my children have been in a dangerous position. I want my rent reduced. CIH has welcomed the bill, broadening landlords' responsibilities to include structural defects as well as um, the general state of repair is a really important step. Um, and as many councils are stretched, it does give some tenants um, a faster option, while bearing in mind that access to legal representation um, is difficult with limits on legal aid, um, and also the fear of comebacks that Tamara mentioned. Something um, we've identified that it's worth considering is that the provisions don't apply to residential licences. So that's where occupiers don't have exclusive occupation of the property. And as such, they have fewer rights and, and less security of tenure. I think something we um, would be alert to is about unscrupulous, unscrupulous landlords potentially um, seeking to create sham licences as a way of evading the provision, so saying someone doesn't have exclusive occupation when in fact they do. Um, so I think it's worth bearing that in mind and trying to have some safeguards in around that if possible. Consumer redress is very important to us in training standards, obviously. Uh, what we are concerned is exactly what, what uh, both comments said, is that tenants are too scared to come forward and complain when there is an issue. They, they're worried about being evicted. They're worried about um, the way they get treated by the landlord if they de decide to stay in the property. Uh, it's very, very difficult for them to just up sticks and move because most of the time the deposit money is tied up until all this gets resolved. Um, I, I think it's, it's a very, very difficult process for uh, an average consumer to go through the county court process um, and made doubly more when the other side turns up with with very experienced barristers um, it, it's really really stressful um, we are concerned that there, there could be a great many fraudulent um, exactly what you said about um, creating fake licenses fake paperwork that kind of thing um, and going back to the previous points about things like um, energy efficiency ratings and that kind of thing there is a possibility that there could be a number of, of faked paperwork out there that could put a tenant into a really difficult position somewhere where they are going to find it really difficult to argue their case and come out of it so we would want to look at a strengthening of, of ombudsman and that kind of thing thanks okay. yeah mine's on selective uh, licensing schemes um, so several local authorities have adopted landlord licensing uh, schemes to improve the quality of the private rented se uh, sector. Um, is licensing an effective way to improve the sector? Um, well, a lot of our members tell us that, that it is. Um, where, where licensing is accompanied by inspections, it's certainly an effective way. Um, I think the big difference between licensed properties and, and areas which don't have licensing is, is the way that um, the system works where the tenant in unlicensed areas would have to complain to the council and then the council would have to give 24 hour notice to the landlord and tell them that the tenant has complained. This puts off tenants from complaining in the first place. In licensed areas, authorities can go in and inspect properties without any reason and that means that they go in and they find things that, that are wrong with it without the tenant having to come forward. So I think from that perspective, you can see how it would improve standards. Um, 
but I think it should be up to local authorities to decide how widely the, the scheme should apply. I know some of them choose very small specific areas where they know there are problems and others think that the problem is wider. Consumer education is easier when there is a licensing scheme because what you can do is you can publicise that and you can tell tenants or prospective tenants exactly what they should be looking for in a, in a landlord. Um, it's easier also to provide education to those businesses, um, which is what the landlords are, and even though some of them don't think they are businesses, they actually are. And it's much easier to provide that education and guidance to them if you know who they are in the first place. We think licensings um, are useful to tool. Um, there are challenges around enforcement, but I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, local markets vary quite widely, so it's helpful that local authorities have the freedom to decide how, how best to do it. Um, something we've thought of um, is to help local authorities identify privately rented properties and target their efforts, um, is that potentially there could be some sharing of information between council tax and enforcement teams to help. Um, it could be a simple data protection thing, but it would certainly help with pinpointing and having more effective Does outcomes. that actually go on? Is there any evidence of that going on, or is this just something that you... That's something we've considered <coughs> might be worth recommending. Okay. Yeah. On that same point, um, what are some of the alternative approaches local authorities could adopt to support letting agents uh, in driving up standards in the private rented sector? There are, there are many schemes that trading standards and things like... Um, buy with confidence and that kind of thing that could be extended into that but also um, there they, they could be um, if it was mandatory for everybody to belong to a consumer redress scheme and that kind of thing then there would be that kind of thing um, the other issues to do with the housing obviously would, would be separate so we couldn't answer on that one I know that lots of local authorities engage with landlords and, and agents in their areas and they try to um, train them and educate them about their responsibilities. Um, in other nations of the UK there are national registration schemes like in Wales all landlords have to do a very short cheap course on how to be a good landlord and we believe that that's a good system if you're going to go in and put other people's lives in, in, in your hands um, then it's a good way of, of knowing what your responsibilities are. On um, alternative approaches, I think preventative work is is very positive. We know a lot of local authorities are engaging in that, um, and things like opportunities to, to learn to be a good landlord um, are, are to be welcomed. Uh, just one uh, particular question, and I've got more general one. Just on, on lockdown properties, which are becoming um, unfortunately more commonplace in parts of London, I think in particular. Um, is this anything you think that could be done now by central or local government to, to deal with this uh, uh, development, which really is quite uh, appalling and is taking a lot of uh, resources uh, from the taxpayer for pretty awful accommodation? Um, I'm afraid we can't really comment on that because we've never seen the final report from that project. Um, I think it was shared with DCLG at the time, um, although we know the, the basics of it. It's difficult for me to comment in detail on what could be done without having seen the detailed work behind it. Well, you don't have to see a report to know what might be done to cure a problem that's out there that your members must be dealing with on a daily basis. Well, um, it was a project um, in London that looked at, um, I think, the rate of housing benefit paid for single units yeah. of accommodation um, as opposed to and, and these units were very very small and I think different areas the, without having seen the report different areas seem to have taken different approaches to dealing with this right. essentially they've tried to cut out the, the incentives of that system right. no. I wouldn't have a comment on that okay. Actually, a more general point then um, the private rent sector is growing um, more people living, including more families with children. Um, majority of properties have probably got reasonable properties with reasonable landlords and reasonable managing agents. 
But that minority there, and some of them are absolutely appalling properties, appalling landlords, rogues, criminals. But your members throughout the country are only actually tapping a tiny fraction of them, aren't they? I mean, in, in some authorities, your members are not prosecuting a single one of these people a year. So, come on, you've got the, 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 the canvas in front of you now. Tell us what two or three things you would like to see done to actually solve the, some of these uh, challenges that are out there. As I said right at the beginning, what we want is for local authorities to put the resources into so housing resources. enforcement. It's all about powers or legislation at all? I think the powers and legislation are there, but there aren't enough people on the ground to, to be able to, to take a prosecution, to respond to... If there are two officers in a huge area with thousands and thousands of private renter sector properties, there simply isn't enough resource for them to go out and visit all the properties. Um, and, so, and so some local authority policies are about taking informal approaches and, and uh, you know, working with landlords, as you've heard from Wandsworth, um, to, to, solve, to solve problems, because going to court can take years. I want to push a bit harder, because Melvin Reese said a few minutes ago, but we, we're getting bits of legislation all the time, uh, and it's piecemeal. And yet you're saying it's all all right, everybody understands it, there's no problem. Some of the legislation goes back over 100 years. Mm -hmm. Is it really fit for purpose, or shouldn't we be having an overall look at what it is and what it's designed to do and whether it's actually capable of doing it? Well, I was suggesting that it wasn't part of a strategic approach, and ideally that's what we need, um, an overall <sighs> view about what we want to achieve and what we need to do in order to get there. It's almost as if the growth in the sector has taken us by surprise and it certainly has increased bigger than, than we thought it would. But at the same time, and I'm sorry to bring up resources again, um, we've seen a one-fifth reduction in the amount of spending um, by councils on enforcement activity. Um, around £8.75 per privately rented home a year. Um, so th there are some real issues that need to be addressed, I think. And, and just to add to that, of course we could improve legislation by looking at it together. Um, there are parts of it that probably don't align as well as they could be aligning. Um, but essentially I think we do need the people to be able to take, you know, civil penalties are great but you need to design a whole policy on the ground to be able to use them in the first place. So, so we need the people and, and then we can look at the whole legislation. Yeah. I think another um, fundamental reason why landlords and agents are able to exploit people in this way is the acute shortage of affordable housing of good quality. And that's a combination of a declining level of social rented homes, but also for some people, difficulty accessing um, other good quality options. Um, so we need to consider that as well. I'm intrigued by this. I, know, I don't think anyone doubts that, you know, as Councillor Lawton said in the previous session, give me more money and I can do more, of course. But what's very noticeable in the evidence is the vast difference between very often neighbouring authorities who have the same powers and very often the same demographics. Why is it that neighbouring authorities with the same setup are able to perform radically differently? You know, some on, really on top of their game, they know their market, they know where the rogues are, they're engaged, next door, who knows? That's not about money, that's about leadership. What's your view on that? Well, it is about leadership, exactly, and it's about local priorities and how many people you've got in the team to be able to assess the market, to go out to inspect properties, to see whether a licensing scheme is needed for certain problem areas. Um, I think when you have a couple of officers um, just being able to firefight and you know, you're getting hundreds of complaints from tenants and no more money is being given to your department, that's a problem. So, so political what leadership. So what we're seeing is, in areas where they're well resourced, they're performing really well. They're, they're being proactive. They're doing everything that they need to do. And then there are those areas that aren't doing enough because there aren't enough people in the team. Locally. Or they don't see it as a priority. Or they don't see it as a priority. I would say local authorities have to be influenced by 
um, the, the council that they belong to and their local priorities, as well as national enforcement priorities. Uh, in trading standards, we work intelligence-led now. We don't do routine inspections. What we do is, um, because of, of the massive cuts, of as much as 50% in, in many authorities to trading standards budgets, then what we've had to do is turn to being intelligence-led, and therefore what we deal with is what we get the most intelligence about there being a problem. We do horizon scanning, we do um, tactical assessments, and we look very proactively at what we think should be the work that we do. Um, and it's and I, very, I, very I, difficult I, to balance. I get that, but very often you, you can literally look at the written, written evidence and you can see the enforcement levels, the activity levels of neighbouring authorities with very similar resources. And it says to me yeah. it's about political leadership in many cases and, and that is the driving force. And that's where you see the difference between a housing market that's properly regulated and one that isn't. And so yeah. simply saying it's, it's the cuts... You know, well, what, if it's the cuts, why are two neighbouring authorities? Also, enforcement levels come from um, a huge amount of work prior to that. Trading standards work on the basis that we try and advise and, and give guidance to businesses and work with businesses first. And therefore, if if that's what's happened and that's been successful in an area, then you won't see any prosecutions and you won't see any enforcement results. But in effect, what you've done is you've prevented the problem in the first place. So effective business guidance, effective consumer education, effective work in general mm -hmm. in that area could prevent prosecutions, which is ultimately what we want. We want the market to work well and fairly. We want consumers protected <coughs> and we want businesses thriving. We don't want to be out there prosecuting people. What mm -hmm. we want is to stop it from happening in the first place. Okay. So in... in some areas that might be what you're seeing is that you're seeing more proactive enforcement work which means education and guidance first rather than straight in for a prosecution okay. one point um, about uh, the um, housing health and safety regulations which of itself is such a mouthful it's, uh, it's amazing that uh, um, it, 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 we haven't got a shortened um, uh, version of it but isn't it so complicated that the environmental health, I'm sorry, men do struggle to understand it fully, and that's the evidence we've had so far, but most landlords don't understand it at all. The tenants probably don't even know about it. So shouldn't we have something which is more relevant that everyone can understand with regard to fitness standards of properties? Don't we need to have a look at it? it I think we should have another look at it. Um, I'm not sure going back to the old fitness standard is the way. When we asked this question in our survey, our members who worked under the old fitness standard, most of them preferred a risk-rated approach because it looks at the effect of poor housing on health rather than an arbitrary standard. Um, and also it was recognised the reason we got rid of the old fitness standard was because it, the application of it was very variable but I think we should consider new standards like energy efficiency is a great example and we should see how the HHSRS can be improved. Okay. It's something slightly bizarre about a system which says a property can be <coughs> made fit not because you go into the property but because the tenant changes. Um, not necessarily but vulnerable tenants um, the hazard comes out worse for the elderly and for young people yes. but that has an effect on so the hazards or when you do the assessment the hazard is always the worst but it's when you come to taking the enforcement action that you have to take into account who the actual tenants are and that's one of the things that should be clarified in the enforcement guidance because obviously visitors to the property could be the elderly even if they're not living there all the time so really you know rickety yeah. stairs could kill them okay we go on to the draft tenant fees bill. Um, Liz. Yeah, okay. So does the draft tenant fees bill um, give local trading standards uh, enough uh, and an appropriate level of enforcement power? Back to resources again, aren't we? Um, unfortunately, we would need resources to be able to enforce this properly because, as I said previously, um, 
enforcement isn't just about taking people to court, prosecuting them and keeping the money for the fines. It is about a huge amount of work before that to do with educating <coughs> the traders and the tenants and obviously creating business guidance and making sure that this is being adhered to. It's going to be really difficult to envisage um, being able to do this work without proper resourcing locally and the, there's a possibility that it might be necessary to have a, a, a collation of, of all the work and to have some kind of overarching body over this. No. No. Okay. So do you think that the financial penalties in the draft bill uh, will be a sufficient deterrent to landlords and letting agencies from breaching the, the law? It needs to be on a sliding scale, and, and it all comes down to um, is it the first offence and the, the, the scale of the consumer detriment as well. Um, what you might find is, is one landlord with one property and one tenant, and it hasn't been going on for very long. Or you might find that the, there are hundreds of properties involved and huge amounts of consumer detriment going back over years. So I think it needs to be proportionate in relation to the actual consumer detriments involved in the offence and the potential detriments in the future. Right. So does that mean you'd like to see some guidance on, on the levels if you're talking about a sliding scale? Very much so, yes. It would be um, it would make sense for it to not start at too low a level because obviously um, as they said previously it, when you get to a prosecution stage you have done an awful lot of work yeah. and there may have been a number of, of actions before the prosecution um, and I think the actual penalties need to be prohibitive enough to stop this from happening again. Mm. So do you think the penalties uh, in the draft bill will be sufficient to cover the cost of resourcing this additional work? Definitely not because at the end of the day there's, there's a huge amount of work that would need to be done. Also what you wouldn't want is for trading standards to be accused of only doing this work just to obtain the money from the fines because that's not why we do any of the work that we do we do it because the intelligence suggests that there is consumer detriment or business detriment and that this is a market that needs working so the work that would need to be done in producing the guidance and actually working through this with the business mm -hmm. is a huge amount of work and what you would get at the end from very few prosecutions would in no way reflect the amount of work that you put into it. So that kind of preventative work isn't accounted for? Never if accounted don't for. No, it's never accounted for. And this is the issue that Trading Standards has at the moment, is that the preventative work is very, very expensive. And with the cuts that we're facing, we're going to find it more and more difficult to do that work. OK. And I think in your submission to the government's public consultation, um, the Institute said that landlords and letting agents who breach the um, fees ban should be penalised by a banning order offence and a civil penalty of up to £30,000. What was the reason for that? Um, at um, present, with estate agents, that can happen. If there, if there is a prosecution under one of the trigger offences under the Estate Agents Act, then estate agents can be banned from, from acting in that field again. Um, what you find with letting agents and landlords if, if they are repeat offenders um, then it may be that it would be appropriate for that to happen because obviously by the time you get to a prosecution you will have normally advised them two or three times you have taken preventative action mm -hmm. and you've worked with them so what you've got is you've already got a repeat offender by the time you get to court mm -hmm. um, this is a massive area for the tenants because quite often it takes an awful lot for a, a tenant to come forward and make an official complaint because they are scared of, of the repercussions and the issues around that. So what you get is when it gets that far, then the problem is usually huge. They don't complain about the little things mm. and therefore that would indicate that that problem is sufficiently serious to consider that kind of action. Okay, so you're learning from experience in other legislation yes. to comment on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just 
to explore a, a little bit further about enforcement bodies, um, will the retention of any money levied through civil penalties um, sufficiently equip trading standards to enforce the draft bill? And if not, how, um, how much should the fines be? I don't think that the fines should be funding the enforcement work that comes prior to this because um, when you issue a, a, a fine in the court and you have the costs, you, you don't ever get the, the real costs of what the investigation costs. But the education and the advice and the guidance and producing all of that and working with the business is going to cost a huge amount proportionate to how many businesses are in your local area and whether they belong to one of the um, letting agents associations or whether they're just lots of individual landlords could cost different amounts in different areas that's where the money is going to be spent mostly and therefore obtaining and keeping the money from the fines doesn't really cover a proportion of the costs so it would be difficult to answer and, and, until anybody could undertake some kind of survey on how much preventative work would be expected to be done you couldn't put a cost on how much how much it would take to to do that education mm. it's, it's obviously a, a real challenge for local authorities given the existing pressures you know they're, they're, they're really under a lot of pressure I think um, with having to deliver more with possibly less and of course as has been explained there is this this explosion in the private rental sector so there is a desperate need to kind of ramp up the enforcement level so the funding the money needs to come from somewhere uh, to make sure we have good standards across the the, uh, the piece really how do you envisage the um, the lead authority interacting with the local uh, authorities um, if I can agency. draw on my experience where I work with the estate agents team at the moment rather than obviously speaking as, as behalf of, of the Chartered Trading Standards Institute, um, the lead authority for estate agents, we work as an overarching body, we work very closely with, with trading standards and other enforcement agencies. Um, we, we work a lot on, on intelligence sharing and <coughs> producing guidance and, and um, working with the local authority and finding out about prosecutions and issues that they have going on that they then pass to us. So I would imagine that it would work in a very similar way. Okay. And are there ways the bill could be simplified to, to support enforcement better? There could be one lead enforcement authority for estate agents and lettings rather than to have two separate bodies. There's quite a lot of crossover. Um, at present, this wouldn't be possible because the um, the legislation provides for a lead authority or it would be have to be in England, and uh, the estate agents team is hosted in Wales. But that could be amended in legislation. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, are there any loopholes in the legislation um, and the intended consequences that you think we ought to be looking at and recommending that should be addressed? I think from CIH point of view, we welcome the proposals overall. Um, we know from our members that finding the money for upfront fees is a real barrier to people trying to find a home, including those who are threatened with homelessness. For us, we would like to see it come into effect as soon as possible because we have the Homelessness Reduction Act coming into effect on the 3rd of April and it would play an important part in um, removing barriers to access. Um, an area of concern is around default fees, that's already been mentioned, um, both in terms of the lack of def definition around what could be included there and also what reasonable charges might be. And a concern for us is that potentially that could be um, exploited quite considerably um, by perhaps less scrupulous um, agents. Um, also, the maximum tenancy deposit um, up to six weeks' rent is quite high. I know it won't always be charged, it's a maximum, but you could be looking at an average of around £1,000 up front or £1,800 up front in, in London. Um, again, that's a potential barrier, so we would wonder whether four weeks um, would be a more appropriate figure. 
And, and we also we really welcome this this draft bill because we need to remove as many barriers as possible from people for people moving away from poor accommodation to better accommodation. There'll still be barriers there with the deposit being quite high, but I would echo the default fees um, concerns that you've heard from other people. Uh, we don't want to leave any loopholes in this bill that would just allow agents to to charge um, tenants by a different route um, because to amend the bill again will take a really long time and we want to, and, and I, I know I've had so many people asking me already, have the fees been banned? And I've had to tell them no, <laughs> they haven't been banned yet. The point was raised by Pierce Witness from Boston about the, the issue for district councils, perhaps in a fairly rural location with a, a county council organisation uh, often based some miles away. Um, do you think that the legislation can be enforced by uh, others than trading standing officers, maybe um, private sector housing officers, environmental health officers who go into the properties anyway uh, and work in the area? Uh, could, could powers be delegated to them? I think it's it's different legislation and it's looking at um, the fairness of the fees, isn't it, and on what should be done. I think trading standards are enforcing very similar kind of legislation um, that would cross over with this in a way. For example, consumer protection from unfair trading regulations talks about um, misleading statements, misleading omissions, and, and things said to induce people into contracts. So there's quite a lot of crossover with legislation that trading standards originally enforce. Um, so I, I think the, the the fees and the upfront stuff come into inducing people into the original contract, um, the actual standards and the um, the quality of the housing is a it's, it's completely separate because it's two separate issues. What you've got is the the way that people are induced into signing this contract and coming into right. okay, I, in the I, I beginning. Take the point, but but during the course of the tenancy, there may be arguments about um, you know whether, whether the price of replacing a key can be taken from the holding deposit, or there may be issues about trying to get fees back from tenants through um, a, a termination agreement of some kind. These are going to come up during the course of the tenancy. Um, yeah, do we really need a separate set of officers to enforce those when other officers are already dealing with the housing conditions maybe in the property? I think as I long mean, as there's a good relationship between trading standards officers and environmental health, you know, <coughs> issues can be, information can be shared and issues can be shared, um, but they are, they are slightly different issues. Um, right. I think we already do work quite closely together. There would be occasional um, things that would get passed between the two departments and work jointly on um, on occasion. Um, things like uh, charging extra for using utilities and that kind of thing would, would already be dealt with by both. Um, I think there are plenty of, of capabilities there that people could work together. I, I don't think it's been an issue in the past. Right, thank you uh, all for coming to give evidence to us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Order, order, that brings us to the end of the public proceedings for today.